Dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, God's grace, his mercy, his peace have all been made yours because of that King of glory who has come to save us. Underneath the city of Rome, there are a series of caves that are called catacombs that stretch for miles and miles. During times of persecution, the Christian church used to go underground. They used to go into these catacombs in order to worship and to spend time with each other. Archaeologists have discovered in one of those catacombs what they believe to be one of the earliest depictions of the crucifixion of Christ. Scratched on one of those cave walls is this picture. It is the picture of a cross with a man hanging on it, and the man's head is that of a donkey. Next to it is a person who is worshiping the man on the cross, and underneath is this caption which reads, Alexandrus worships his God. This ancient graffiti is meant to be a mockery of Jesus and anybody that would worship Jesus. Believing that a man who died on the cross is God, who came into the world to save us, seems like utter foolishness to many people. And the mockery of Christ and Christians continues to this day. All you have to do is read the comments on an internet article published by a Christian author. And you will find in those comments the ridicule of the author, the author called ridiculous, called stupid, called arrogant, called ignorant because they have defended their Christian beliefs or what the Bible teaches. And I'm sure that there would be some people today who maybe outside of these church walls would look at you sitting here and would wonder why. Why would you come to worship on a day called Palm Sunday a person who rode into the ancient city of Jerusalem 2,000 years ago on a donkey. The thought that Jesus is who you and I just claimed him to be, the king of glory, probably seems like utter foolishness to many people. And I'm sure that it probably seemed that way to some people in the Palm Sunday crowd as well. This Jesus, he looked like any other person who was standing around them. He certainly did not look kingly by any stretch of the imagination. He did not seem to have the divine power and glory that you would normally associate with the Lord God Almighty. And yet the words of Philippians chapter 2 help us to appreciate and understand the events of Palm Sunday and those that followed it. It is the words of Philippians chapter 2 that that show us not only who Jesus is, but equally important, why Jesus is who he is. And so this morning, I would invite you to see the power of God. To see the power of God in the passion of God. That is his deep desire to love you and to save you and to serve you. Now, when you look at the words of Philippians chapter 2, they are some of the most pointed passages in the entire Bible that describe for us the nature of Jesus. That is, who Jesus is. And if you look especially at verses 6 through 11 in a Bible, you'll find that they are formatted similar to the Psalms are formatted. And that's because verses 6 through 11 are poetry. Some people believe that they were recited or possibly even sung as a hymn among the early Christian church to describe Jesus and who he is. Who knows? They may have been the songs that those early Christians sang while in the catacombs underneath the city of Rome. By inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul takes these words And he uses them to describe the mystery that is the person of Christ. And he begins with a marvelous statement. He says about Jesus, Who being in very nature God. These words make it absolutely clear who Jesus is. That Jesus is fully and completely God. That Jesus possesses the divine nature and all of the divine attributes that the other two persons of the Trinity also possess, God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. That means that Jesus 
has been in existence from all of time. That Jesus possesses, has at his disposal, all of the divine power. And he is worthy of all the divine glory that the Trinity is worthy of. Now that's usually what we think of with God, right? Some powerful, glorious being. That's the picture that comes to our mind, and, and rightfully so. I mean, you think about how God revealed himself in the Old Testament. Oftentimes, his revelations came accompanied by vast displays of power and glory. Let me give you three examples. Go to the creation account. And there you have God calling into existence the universe and everything in it with the command of his word, let there be. Think of Moses. Moses, when he came back from standing in the presence of God, what did Moses look like? His face actually glowed. Or the third example. Think of the glory of the Lord. As it descended upon Mount Sinai, the people that looked at it thought it was a consuming fire, a dark, ominous, surrounding cloud that they were afraid of. Now that's God, right? Powerful and glorious and radiant and, and holy and reverent. But that's not the God that you see on Palm Sunday. Riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. And why is that? The Apostle Paul explains when he goes on to say, Who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Jesus chose not to grasp the divine attributes that were rightfully his as God. He did not lose them. He did not have them taken away. Rather, he chose not to make use of them for a time. The Lord God Almighty, while still possessing his divine nature, decides to take on a human nature as well as he is conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. God chooses to limit himself. To limit himself to being like any one of us, like any other human being, who also are limited in our power, who are limited in our knowledge and our understanding. Yes, when Jesus did make use of his divine power to perform a miracle, what was the purpose? It was never to benefit himself or to make his life easier. Whenever Jesus performed a miracle, it, it was always to benefit the people around him, either by helping them, but most of all, by showing them what they could not see with their physical eyes. To show them the divine nature that was hidden behind the human flesh. Why would God allow himself to such human limitations? Well, it's because God saw what had happened to the human race. He saw how sin had shackled and enslaved us from the moment of our conception, making it completely impossible for us to be what God requires of us, to live with him in peace. God saw how our sinful natures, how our sinful nature had infected our motives and our minds and our attitudes, how often that sinful nature drives our, our words and our actions. The selfishness that convinces us to, to think first about what is best for me instead of what is best for the person sitting next to me. That sinful nature that convinces us to, to push to the side God's word when God asks us to do something that is going to cause us some inconvenience. Or when God's word explains something that I just can't quite understand. That frustration and that anger erupts from our sinful nature when somebody does not see things the way that I do. That's why God needed to become man. God came to live in our place. God came to selflessly serve, to love and to care, to faithfully serve the Lord in every way that I have and you have not. As Jesus comes into this world, 
He possesses that divine and human nature which then allows him to not only live in our place, but to do all those things perfectly so that he can live perfectly in the place of every human being that has or ever will live. Now, as amazing as that fact is, it really only is scratching the surface of the depth of God's, of his passion and his love for you. And if you don't go on to read what the Apostle Paul writes in verse 8, then you're missing out. It's like turning off the TV halfway through the game and not watching the rest of it. You'd never want to do that, right? To see the depths to which Jesus would stoop shows him going far beyond anything that you would ever expect of any human being, or rather divine being. Jesus goes on to be described to do this. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus becomes man in order to die. And not just to die a death of natural causes, but to die a death that would demonstrate his purpose for coming into the world. Have you ever stopped to consider that? Why would Jesus die on a cross? I mean, there are a million other ways that Jesus could have died. Why did he choose a cross of all things? Well, really, the cross is the perfect place. The perfect place for Jesus to publicly demonstrate what his death was accomplishing for us. As Jesus hung on the cross, he was there suffering the punishment of a crime that he had never committed even Pontius Pilate declared that Jesus was innocent right before sentencing him to die. But as Jesus hung on that cross, Jesus was more importantly suffering the punishment of hell for sins that he had never committed, for our selfishness and our greed, for our arrogance and our anger. There the innocent Son of God suffers for sins that he never committed committed. And as Jesus gives his life and he suffers hell, Jesus is capable of paying every sin of all time because why? Because of his divine nature. Because he is true God. So that through his life and through his death, he can serve us and pay the full price of our salvation. You see, that's really why we're here on this morning, on this Palm Sunday. That's why we celebrate the man who rides into Jerusalem on that donkey. Because we see in that man the God that we need for our salvation. While it might be neat to think of God demonstrating in baffling power and glory His divinity to the oohs and ahs of the crowd around Him, like a Super Bowl halftime show, that might be neat. But that's not what we need. That wouldn't save us. Instead, we need a God who is willing to humble himself, to put aside what is rightfully his, to live and die for us so that we can share in his glory. That's the type of God that we need. And on Palm Sunday, as Jesus rides into Jerusalem, we see that that is exactly the God that we have been given. A Savior who has lived and died so that we may share in his glory for eternity. Now let me ask you this morning, are you satisfied with that God? Every once in a while, I like to listen to people react to either a book or a movie that has been written or produced uh, that is supposed to be Christian or supposed to be Bible-based. It's interesting to listen to people's conversations. Well, there certainly are a lot of good ones out there, um, that give us at least the very opportunity to talk about our Christian faith or for people to, to consider their relationship with God through faith in Jesus. Every once in a while, it makes me wonder. I remember a couple of years ago listening to a reviewer who was a critic of a book that had been turned into a movie. And it was supposed to be Bible-based, and he asked this question. Is this who God reveals himself to be or have we just made God into who we want him to be? A God who makes my life easier. A God who gives me what I want. 
A God who gives me security in financial things. A God who fixes my problems. A God who solves my relationship dilemmas. A, a God who, who does whatever I want him to do. In other words, have we made God into our servant to do what we want, when we want, how we want him to? Well, guess what? God is our servant. But God has served us in a way that far exceeds anything that we could have ever even begun to imagine. We have a God who serves us not by simply making our lives peaceful and pleasant for a time. We have instead a God who has served us by living and dying so that we can permanently be rescued from the problems and the pains of this broken world to live with him forever in everlasting glory. You see, that's the power of our God. The power of our God that we experience daily as he announces that we are still his forgiven people. The power of our God that he is now using in its fullness to control all of history as the ascended and risen Savior. That is the power of our God who promises that one day he will take me and you to stand before him in joy and gratefulness as he displays the fullness of his divine glory for all to see. That, my friends, that is the power of our God. The power of our God that we see on this Palm Sunday as Jesus rides into Jerusalem, living in our place, humbly fulfilling his Father's will. The power of our God that we see throughout the events of this week as Jesus travels to the cross and there sacrifices his innocent life for our salvation. That is the King of glory, whose humility may still be mocked by some, but whose humility is his greatest of glory and our glory as well. Because this Jesus is our God, he is our servant. He is our Savior. Amen.